Get your Bibles, if you have them, to turn to Mark chapter 2. If I can get a little bit more monitor and a little bit, get me in the house, keep me hot. Preacher's, preacher's livelihood is his voice. And um, it's what we do, you know, and so we have to protect our voice. But it's so good to see so many out on a Wednesday night. Imagine where you could have been tonight. Imagine where you were on some Wednesday nights years ago. Uh, you would not have been in the house of God, but for the grace of God, God's grace is good. Thank you, um, the whole Stair family. I love you guys. Thank you. Um, if you ever need me, you know what to do. You know where to find me. If you ever need some oxtails, you know where to find me. Some mac and cheese and some slap your mama cornbread, you know where to find me. Soul Food Bistro. Shameless plug. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark chapter 2 I'm going to read verse 11 from the New King James Version of the Bible and then I'm going to read it again from the New Living and uh, you'll find these words I say to you arise take up your bed and go to your house usually when I read a verse of scripture and say that's what I'm going to read people usually punctuate my reading of the scripture with a amen. So the second time, we're going to try it. This time it's going to work. Watch. Mark chapter 2, verse number 11. New living. Stand up. Pick up your mat and go home. From the subject, your mat is your testimony. Thank you for this time, Lord. Bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do me a favor, put your hands together for the word of the Lord. I put some things down because I wanted to be concise. I wanted to make sure that I covered everything that I need to cover. So I'm just going to start by saying I ended our year last year at the Potter's House with a message entitled, You Need a Testimony before the year is out. It was a very strategic message because I wanted everybody under the sound of my voice to know that, number one, what their lives were like before they met Jesus, how they met Jesus, and what their lives were like now after they have met Jesus. That is your testimony. What your life was like before Jesus, how you met Jesus, and what your life is like now that you met Jesus. It's amazing that somebody didn't just flip over and jump up and turn over chairs and do a wheelie on the floor and break dance when I said that because each and every child of God must first of all understand in order to be a serious child of God, you need a testimony. You need a testimony. So I would hate to think about what my life would be like uh, even right now had I not uh, met Jesus in my home 40 years ago. 40 years ago, this past year, I've been saved now. My testimony is clear. I used to be a no good, good for nothing, low down, scum of the earth, back, back in the home argument center on my way to hell. But God, who was rich in mercy with his great love, would be loved us, saved me. Most people that know me know that when I got saved, I was home. I had a glass of Jack Daniels in one hand and weed in the other, and Prince was singing tonight, I'm a party like it's 1999. <laughs> I had never heard a sermon before in my life, had never been to a church service, but once in my life, and when I went then, I had smoked weed in the bathroom, sat on the front row, and dared the preacher to say something to me. So all of us have a past, am I right? Yeah. All of us should have a testimony. Recalling that moment and reciting that moment over and over again, as I do, obviously I do regularly, it's gotten me through some really tough and difficult times. Often we run into stuff and we need to remember where we come from. We need to know that if he brought us out, he's going to take us through. I always tell our people, if God delivered you from hell, can he get you out of this marriage? I don't mean divorce. <laughs> 
Can he get you through your marital difficulties? Can he get you through your lack? Can he get you through the frustrations that you might have in life? If you've been translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, can he take care of this? And so he brought me out so he can take me through. So my testimony says I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So I found out how and why this is so important to me. I found it in the scriptures. It's in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11, the first part. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The Bible gives us two weapons along with our faith. For this is the victory that overcomes the world. John says, even our faith. But also he gives us two weapons to use. And these weapons, if you Pentecostal from the old school, you know about the blood. <laughs> the blood, the blood, the blood. I plead the blood, the blood, the blood. The blood, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So these are the ways in which these two weapons that we can use to get through some difficult times in our life. We know that the blood has cleansed us. As we partook of the supper tonight, the blood has supplied for us all that we need and has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He bore our sins on that tree. So he paid the price for us. We've been purchased not with corruptible things of silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said he purchased us with his own blood. So the blood and then our testimony. You have to have a testimony. So in the Gospel of Mark, there's this powerful story of a man's life before Jesus. It shows how he met Jesus and then his life after his encounter with Jesus. And I've discovered that many times the Lord reveals himself to us. I don't know about some of you, but to me, we find ourselves sometimes in impossible situations. And sometimes you got to get all the way down in order for you to look up. And it's there that many of us have found the Lord. Now I'm trying to walk you through this, so sometime during this message, you're gonna bump into your testimony, or you're gonna bump into something that reminds you of where you were before you met Jesus, how you met Jesus, and what your life is like now that you have met Jesus. So Jesus is often fully revealed to us when it appears that there is no hope at all. No hope at all when nobody can help you. That's what it, what it takes to get a miracle, right? Uh, in order to get a miracle, listen, you, you promise you're going to tell everybody, but I'll tell you this. Listen, in order to get a miracle, you don't need faith only. You need a miracle situation. I thought that was so good. I'm going to pay me. Let me do this right here. I'm going to bless me. I'm going to put money in my own pocket. I'm going to throw it on the floor in front of me. I thought this was going to be easy. Somebody might be where I'm talking about tonight because what if I were to tell somebody here tonight that God may be getting to do something, maybe get ready to bust a move for you right now, this night, on this very day. That God may be getting ready to do something that's impossible for you, that you thought was impossible. Isaiah 43, 19 says, for I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wastelands. Basically, God is just saying, for the record, y'all, I am the God who can make a way out of no way. Anybody here have a testimony? of God having made a way out of no way when you didn't see your way, couldn't find your way? Has God ever bust a move for anybody in this room? So let me get out of that and get to the ministry of Jesus. Let's visit a town by the name of Capernaum. Capernaum was considered the headquarters of the ministry of Jesus. When he called Peter and, and James and John and, and Andrew went and got Peter, they, they followed Jesus. They left their nets and they followed him to a town called Capernaum. And in Capernaum is where Jesus worked many of his miracles. He performed many signs and wonders. And the place was on fire because Jesus was there. The Messiah had come and he was living up to his legend. And of course, as a result of many 
Many, many people, many, many miracles, many, many people begin to follow Jesus. They went wherever Jesus went. Wherever Jesus was, that's where they were. People everywhere begin to gossip about his miracles. They begin to gossip about him casting out devils. They begin to gossip about him healing the sick. And they begin to gossip about all of those things. And then people begin to just come from all around. And I, I find it to be the same today, Elevate, because if Jesus is in the midst, people will come. They'll come at 9.15, they'll come at 11, they'll come at 12.45, they'll come at 2.30, they'll come on Saturday at 4.30, they'll come on Saturday at 6.30, they'll, they'll come every first Wednesday. Why? Because Jesus is here. Jesus is here, right? So what does that mean? If Jesus is here, if you're coming here because of him, then there must be healing here. There must be deliverance here. There must be pure worship here, true worship here. There must be true praise here. Come on. Jesus' presence then must be here. I'm here. I'm not here because I loved him so much and when he invited me, I just had to come here because he going to give me a semi-decent honorarium. No, that's not why I came here. I came here because, listen, Jesus is here. I came here because Jesus is risen. I came here, listen, if he's not risen, then our meeting here tonight is in vain. And listen, I love y'all. I love everything else that y'all doing in the city and every, all this stuff and growing and moving, but I love the Lord. He heard my cry. <laughs> he pitied my every groan. And what I found in him is a resting place. <laughs> Jesus, I'm here because of Jesus. Now don't act cute. Some of y'all real cute. Y'all real cute. You don't know me. Now I said that two ways. You don't know me. That's why you're acting cute, but you don't know me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, all of us need Jesus to fix something in our lives. That's another reason why some have come in here tonight. You need a fix because you hooked on Jesus. So notice, I don't use a lot of pronouns when I speak of Jesus. I don't say he, him, you know, I don't, I, we got a pronoun problem nowadays. I just say Jesus. You ever take your time and read the book of Mark? Mark, if you do, you'll see that Jesus is actually a healing machine. There's a word in there, straightway, straightway, straightway. He does stuff, and he does it quickly. Mark 1, verse 32 through 34. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Good God Almighty, Jesus was healing everything, everybody, every situation. He was healing all that were oppressed of the devil. People that were hopeless and helpless were hearing that Jesus was able to fix whatever was broken in a person's life. And they were pressing in just to get a touch from him. And in one case, there was a woman that just wanted to touch him that wound up getting healed, not even touching him, but just touching something that was touching him. Yeah, he got more medicine in the hem of his garment than every CBS in the United States of America. She didn't touch him. She touched something that was touching him. That's why it's so important for us to meet together and to not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because you never know who you're touching. You never know who's touching Jesus. And sometimes when you can't get to the pastor, you can't get to one of the lead pastors, one of the elders, you can be touching somebody. Matter of fact, just touch somebody next to you. You might get your healing. Just touch them. Just touch them. That might be the contact that you need. Imagine the joy and the jubilation that they must have been experiencing. The whole city was witness to the miraculous power of God through Christ. So the next day, uh, after that event, Jesus heads out of town to the villages and the hamlets and surrounding areas, and he's doing the same thing. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing the sick, he's performing miracles and casting out many devils. Everywhere Jesus went, he was wreaking havoc on the devil's work. 
which is really fulfilling his purpose. For 1 John 3, 8 said, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Then after ministering to the countryside, here's my story. Jesus comes back to Capernaum. The word's out. Everybody and their mama is coming the first Wednesday. I mean, everybody and their mama is coming to his meetings now. Mark 2, verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door, while he was preaching God's word to them. Y'all see that? They knew the things that Jesus had done prior to him leaving, and now he's back. So now folk came this time for more. That's more. That's for Mo. That's for some of you that, I don't know, I'm in the wrong neighborhood. Right? That's more for some of you. That's more. They came back for more. I'm from the north side. 32209, baby. That's Mo. They wanted some Mo. That's one word, some Mo. So they came back and they wanted more. They wanted more. Uh, they knew the things that Jesus had done. So their expectation was high. Here's where our story really begins. There was a paralyzed man. He laid on a mat, and all he can do was beg daily. He was quadriplegic. His mat and his paralysis kept him from getting to Jesus, at least in time enough to get a miracle, a miracle that he not only desired, but he needed but he just could not mobilize himself to get to him. He missed out the first healing crusade because of his condition. Now Jesus is back, and he comes to that house that I just talked about. When he gets there, it appears that he's gotten there too late again. It's almost like the man laying by the pool of Bethesda that's, that's crippled, and every time the water stirred, he nobody to put him in, so he's just late, and then healings occurred, and it's gone and it's too late for him. The Bible says that he was being carried by four brothers, four brothers. But when they arrived, the crowd was so thick, they thronged Jesus so heavily that they couldn't even get through the crowd. They couldn't even get close because he was laying on his mat and they're trying to maneuver with him on a mat through a crowd of people. Mark two and three. Four men arriving, arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. It looked like it was going to happen this time the same way it did last time. I can't get to him in time. It appeared that what he needed Jesus to do was going to be put on hold. He had to wait just one more time. Somebody say it. One more time. Man, look at here. What, what do you think? Do y'all think that this brother was maybe a little tired of not being able to, look at the condition he was in, to help himself, to, to do something for his family, to pay back those who had done so much for him? Do you think that he was feeling the pain of not being able to do just what we take for granted, what we normally do, brush your teeth and comb your hair and put on your own clothes and play a little ball? Play a, little, play a little hoops and, and you know, do what you got to do and, and just have a job. He was regulated to begging and he had to have four friends to help him sit him every day in the same place or to another place, but all he can do was beg. And I just want to believe that uh, he probably said to them four brothers this day, look here, y'all, I heard Jesus here. So here's what I need y'all to do. I need y'all to get me to Jesus. And y'all tear the roof off the sucker if you have to. <laughs> get me to Jesus. I don't care how you get me to him. Just get me to Jesus. Mark 2, 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head, Jesus' head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Oh, man. I'm sure this brother felt some kind of way. 
He knew his situation was much this worse than some of the, his friends that had got healed in the first crusade, all right, when Jesus was there. And uh, now these same brothers, I'm sure, his so-called friends, uh, being a little selfish, they know the boy can't walk. They know the boy can't use his hand. They know the boy needs help getting to Jesus. But they're back in the meeting, already healed, and keeping him from getting to Jesus. Jesus has already done for them what he's going to do for them. And they're pressing all against it because they want to hear Jesus teach. They want to see what Jesus is going to do. And this brother needs a healing, right? I think it would be safe to say that this brother was missing out on God's best for him because of the other folk who just in the way. Just in the way. He can't get to Jesus because of the other folk in the crowd. Remember that woman with an issue of blood? She pressed through that crowd and said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Remember what the disciples said? Leave him alone. Get away from here. Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were trying to tell him. Remember blind Bartimaeus? Shut up. Blind Bartimaeus said just the louder. Jesus! They said, shut up. Jesus! Hush, man. Jesus! He called Jesus. And so Jesus said, bring him to me. You see this, y'all, in every meeting. There's always somebody who came not just for the music. They, they didn't come just to bump up and down and bump. They didn't just come for the fellowship and to go somewhere to eat afterwards. They didn't come to get no wings after the service. They came to touch Jesus. Come on, in every crowd. They came to touch the Lord in every crowd. Every crowd. So this man was laying on a mat, having to be carried by his friends. It appears that that circumstance had dictated that nothing was going to change this time either. I couldn't do it before. I won't be able to get to him now. Y'all, come on, get me up there. Get me to him. I wonder if there's anybody here who missed an opportunity to be blessed or to be healed or to be touched. I have a personal situation right now. I'm trying to hold back the tears right now. But sometimes you just have to try it again. Come on, if at first you don't succeed, try it again. Elijah had to go up on that mountain and he prayed one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. Sometimes you got to try it again. Naaman, don't dip two times, don't dip three times, don't dip four times, five. You got to try it again. Walk around the walls of Jericho today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, and on the seventh day, seven times. Sometimes things won't move until you try it again. You have to be importunist. You have to be an importunist. You have to use importunity. You got to keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. You don't just say to God one time, all right, God, if you don't do it, I don't know what I'm going to do. You do know what you're going to do. You're going to try it again. And you're going to wait until, wait until God does it for you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting on the Lord is an art. When you wait on God, God will strengthen your heart. Good things come to those who just wait. Come on, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hold on. Hang in there. Change is going to come. You pray for a child many times. You pray for the marriage many times. You pray for your finances many times. You pray for a breakthrough many times. You don't pray these cute little patsy little prayers where you just say, Lord, now I lay me down to sleep and I ask the Lord my soul to keep and if I die before I wake, I ask the Lord my soul to... No! You say, God, look here, I asked you last night and I still ain't seen it yet. God, I need the oh, I need the every hour I need thee and you have to come to God you have to say God I need you like I've never needed you before good God almighty how many times did you come to Jesus even before you got it right some of y'all walked that aisle so many times you come to every invitation <laughs> I, I do this on Sundays I see the same people coming every time every time and so I saw one of my members take him and said no held him back that time I said no 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 don't hold him back this might be the time don't hold him back this might be the time this might be the moment he was waiting on this might be that breakthrough stop laughing at them they keep coming don't look at their cats they still coming don't worry about the 19 earrings in their nose they're still coming they're gonna get it right they're gonna get it right
Let's do it again. So let me help you with something. Are you ready? When your friends are who your friends are rather than who you're hanging out with, could be the difference in you getting blessed or missing out on God and God's blessing for you. Um, let me show you that. Who you hang out with? These men got four good friends. These brothers must have been bombardiggity. They, they were bombardiggity good. They, 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 they were his partners, right? So I, I had a guy in my church who needed some money, fell on some hard times, family was doing bad. And I saw him come up asking for benevolence, like everybody does. When people get saved at our church, we get 10, 20, 30 people. Sometimes there's one person with nine kids. And everybody be like, ah. I'd be like, Lord, there's some bills I got to pay this week. Right? There's a light bill, there's a shoe bill, he gonna need this and that. But anyway, <laughs> The guy came, and, and he needed some help, and I heard his plea, and so I was overhearing him, you know, so I had money in my pocket, like, let me pick my hundred back, and y'all might keep that. I, I, had, uh, I had money in my pocket, and I had it in my pocket, and I followed him out to the car, and I was just going to bless him. They turned him down in their office. I was going to bless him, but when I got to the car, and he rolled the window down, I smelled the weed. And I looked in there, he had three other guys in the car, and they looked notorious. And I couldn't bless him because of who he was hanging out with. <laughs> who you hang out with can keep you from being blessed. But in this case, who you hanging out with can get you blessed. Get God Almighty. So here it is, this paralyzed man had hung out with his friends who were believing God for him. Those are the kind of friends you need that believe God for you. Good God Almighty. Can't y'all hear them? Well, now we taking you to that house and bro, bro, look here. Jesus is gonna heal you. They're they, they gonna encourage him, you ain't missing it this time. If we gotta take the roof off, you gonna get to Jesus. So they get to the house and there's the crowd. Too many people to even get close, but his friends were determined. So he gets blessed because of the right kind of friends. I just want to make that as an aside and leave that with you. Check your friends. His friend says that there has got to be a way. So anybody, thank God right now for a minute before I close this, for friends that will believe for you when you can't believe for yourself. I'm talking about friends that are trying to figure out how to get you delivered, how to get you blessed while they have their own issues and need a blessing themselves. Have you ever had any kind of friend that will give you what they don't have, that would prefer you before themselves? Those kind of friends. So anyway, have you ever heard that what you make happen for somebody else, God will make happen for you? And here's what's happening. So many people right now feel stuck. They feel paralyzed, unable to advance, unable to progress, unable to move forward. And, and you may be wondering, when is my deliverance coming? A lot of people don't like to admit that, you know, because everybody's so, it's Wednesday night, we're the, we're the saved people. We're the, we're the spiritual crowd. We're, we, we voluntarily came. Yeah. I had a drug problem as a kid growing up. They drugged me to church, but I voluntarily came here tonight. So I want to be your friend tonight because I am tonight believing God for you. I believe I'm sent to you tonight to encourage you not to give up. I'm sent to you to command you to keep the faith and I'm sent to you and I hope I can help you to see that God is the God who can still make a way out of no way. You haven't told anybody what you're going through, but God sent me just to remind you that he's able to make a way out of no way. And that's the God that we serve. So his friends took the roof off of the house and left their friend, let him down through the hole in the roof. Let him down. Don't, don't play that keyboard, man. What's wrong with you? I got a long way to go. You crazy? I was going to call for you when I call for you. Get off that keyboard. Just take your hands off of it. I got a clock up here and you're winding down. You, 
You know, I love, wait a minute, let me give you this hundred dollars not to touch that keyboard again. Here, take that, put it in your pocket. I'm gonna pay him to leave that alone. I got to finish this message. He said, I heard that. I said, what's happening? Ooh, ooh. His friends took the roof off the house. <laughs> Let their friend down through the hole in the roof. Then watch what this did to Jesus. Watch what this did. Mark 2, 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Did you see that? He didn't heal the man. He forgave his sin. Here we go now. And I'm, I'm, you want to know why? Okay, I'm glad you asked. So many people just want to get to Jesus for his miracles, for his signs, and for his wonders. They just want a physical blessing. But can I help you with something? Sometimes God wants to make a way in us before he makes a way for us. in us. So many people when they are in a tight, when they're stuck in a bad situation, they only want to walk again. They only want to see again. They want to work again. They, they want to have their family back again. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. I want you to live again. This man had a sin problem. He needed his sins forgiven. Come on, y'all. Jesus wants us to be totally whole, body, mind, and spirit. He wants every bit of us whole. Not just his presence, but his presence. He doesn't want us to just grab his hand but to have his heart and when you see you can be totally healed you, 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 you know that Jesus is able to do it then you'll come to him properly because I'm going to tell you this right now if, if you can be totally healed and go to hell I'm preaching if maybe y'all don't believe in hell but I read it in the Bible somewhere that there's a hell and there's a heaven and, and this man had saving faith and Jesus said this kind of faith has saved you from your sins if you can just get your outside fixed without your inside healed when the next storm comes you'll be right back in the despair that you were in before you got to get your insides right when he got delivered good God Almighty when Jesus forgave his sins and when we get delivered spiritually there's no storm there's no new test there's no circumstances that will rock our world and shipwreck our faith in God can you imagine now this man working on his testimony right can you imagine now he's, he, he came to Jesus remember he came on a, on a mat and now things are happening and you know it, how he met him yeah, you know, he, he coming to Jesus. When he met him, we, we see where he is, how the, 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 the encounter took place, and then what happened as a result of it. He's just working on his testimony. Tell somebody I'm working on my testimony. I'm working on my testimony. Y'all got to help me with this. Uh, so when, when our faith in, is, is in him for our future, then our current condition is just a light affliction. When we know what he's already done, what this man has been through was insurmountable in, in the flesh. His condition was impossible. Uh, now what can happen after this that can make him not believe that Jesus is able to take him through that? What God will do is predicated on what he's already done. If he's already healed you, if he's already blessed you, if he's already restored you, I'm preaching, let me get out of here. Now watch, watch what happens here. He forgives the man of his sin, and then he calls his faith to action, because faith without works is dead. Now that you're forgiven, you need to do something. Verse 10, then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. His friends couldn't help him with this command because they're still up on the roof. They let him down, right? So they can't reach him. So what does this mean? Your friends can get you in to Jesus, but they can't get you up. It takes Jesus to fix your situation. You can invite somebody, but it's going to take Jesus to set them free. So what does this mean? Your friends can get you in. So his faith would make him whole. He had to exercise his faith. Now, I don't know what it is that you need the Lord to do, but I will say this. If the Lord tells you to do something, he will supply you the power to get it done. He will not ask you to do what's impossible to you. What's impossible to you is possible with him. So look at what this man did. Verse 12, Mark 2. And then the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and I'm about to get excited, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. The man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out. Yeah. 
through the stunt only. See, I thought y'all would get it if I told you that he was a quadriplegic, that he had never walked there, you know, was tripping and this and that, and he walked out. Good God Almighty, I feel like I'm about to act like these folk that I'm about to read about when they saw what happened, verse 12. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. In amazement, they begin to praise God and begin to exclaim, we have never seen anything like this before. Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk out and go home. Why in the world would Jesus want this man to pick up that nasty, smelly mat and take it home with him? He had laid on it all his life. It was his crutch. It was his disability. It represented his sorrow. It represented his pain. It reminded him of his paralysis and his failures and his despair and the missing out on all of the blessings of being a part of a family and being able to participate in the things of the of, of the world. Y'all turning me up and down. You could have just left me alone. But Jesus says, pick up your mat. Why? Why pick up your mat? I told y'all my topic was your mat is your testimony. Give me some monitor. His mat was his testimony. That mat represents what his life was like before he met Jesus. Come on. It, it represents what it was like when he met Jesus and, and all of those things that's happening in the sound right now. But as he walks through the crowd, the people see his mat. Walking through the crowd, he let it brush up against some of them. Y'all used to talk about me with my mat, didn't you? Y'all used to talk about he ain't gonna never do nothing, never do nothing. Y'all felt sorry for me, didn't you? But y'all didn't try to help me. Y'all didn't try to help me. Y'all run out all up in there, crowded up in that church. we sitting on the front row would never let me come down there. Mm -hmm. God was moving. Jesus was there and you wouldn't let me in. He's actually carrying what used to carry him. So the mat is no longer his test. But the mat has become his testimony. He gets to play show and tell. He gets to tell the people how he went from laying on his mat to carrying his mat. Come on, how about when he got home? Uh, here we go, how about when he got home? His family, his mama and them, his daddy, his brothers and sisters, the neighbors, <laughs> guess what y'all? They see him walking through the hood. They see him walking in, and then they see him walk in through the front door of his house. This is the man that been laying on a mat, quadriplegic, could not get well. He, he's doing what nobody ever thought he'd do. Imagine mama. His mama heard him coming. Right? She knew that normally the friends brought him home, and at the same time, every day, they would, they would knock on the door, she opened the door, let him in, and they would lay the boy inside of the house. But after a full day of begging and asking of arms, which he did every day, this day, this time, she didn't hear multiple footsteps. This time, she only heard one set of footsteps. Mama knows what time he gets home every day. She knows the shuffling of the friend's feet. She understands the mat and what it sounds like as it creaks as he lays trying to make adjustments on the mat. She would hear the voices even of the friends as they chatted with her son as they came to the door to drop him off and say, we'll see you tomorrow, same time tomorrow. But this time she heard only one voice. And she only heard one set of footsteps. These were the steps that she thought she'd never hear. These are the steps that she had never heard before. These are the steps that she had prayed for time and time again. These were the steps that she longed to hear. These were the steps that she cried for, that she laid awake at night with tears streaming down her face and rolling through her fingers. Can't you hear her? Who is it? Who's there? She doesn't know this is her son. She doesn't hear the regular. Who's there? Then she turns and sees her son standing with his mat in his hand. He's got his mat in his hand, but he's got his testimony in his mouth. What happened to you, son? 
What happened to you? Can you hear that boy? Mama, mama, look at my mat. Mama, Jesus saved me. Mama, Jesus freed me. Mama, Jesus made me whole. Come on. They, they, they brought me to him on my mat, mama. I, I, I met him on the mat, mama. He told me to get up off of my mat, mama. And now I'm carrying my mat, mama. That's what my life was like before I met him, mama. Here's how I met him, mama. And mama, now look at me now. Mama, look at my testimony, mama. Mama, take your rest, mama. Mama, God heard your prayers. You don't have to bathe me no more, mama. You don't have to cook for me no more, mama. You don't have to hide me from the family no more, mama. You can take me to church with your mama. You can take me witnessing with your mama. Mama, I'm your child. I'm whole. Thank you, though, mama, for caring for me. Thank you, mama, when I was down. But Jesus now has lifted me. That mat became his testimony. For years, he cried himself to sleep on that mat. He was paralyzed from the neck down and never believed that he'd ever get up off of that mat. He tried everything and nothing seemed to ever work for him. And then he heard that Jesus was in town. He came to Jesus just as he was, weary, worn, and sad. But he found in Jesus a resting place. Jesus made him glad. Jesus forgave him. Jesus cleansed him. Jesus healed him. Jesus made him whole. Jesus told him, pick up your mat and go home. What's your mat? It can be a bad marriage, a wayward child, a hopeless situation. But let me help you. Bring it to him tonight. Now you can play something softly. <laughs> He'll have you to pick up your mat and he will give you, listen, I'm not done, a testimony. This man never thought he'd get up. But Jesus saw his faith and said to him, get up, take up your mat, and go home. If you're messed up, find you some friends that will believe God with you and will believe God for you. Some of y'all need to kick some folk to the curb. Where do you go? <laughs> Stay there till I'm done. <laughs> you got to learn how to kick some folk to the curb that don't have faith with you and for you. You have to keep pressing your way and do what you've never done in order to get what you know you need. When the Lord sees your faith, when he sees you trying, not crying, he'll say to you, get up, take up your mat and go home. And when you go home, tell everybody who you met along the way when you were being carried on a mat. Tell them you were stuck. Tell them you were hopeless and paralyzed with fear. But the Lord made a way out of no way. That's how I came to Jesus. I was 26 years old. I was a cokehead, alcoholic, and smoked a lot of weed. I had perversions and things in my life that I've never would never tell anybody about it. I just did them. But I didn't need counseling. I didn't need, I didn't thought I needed any. I didn't think I needed anything. But one day I realized that I had a big old God-sized hole in me, something that only God could feel, that nothing else could feel. And alone in my house, laying on my mat, $1,500 worth of unopened liquor on my shelf, half a pound of weed, a couple of grams of cocaine. I said, God, if you're real, save me. I didn't even know save me. I said, help me. Help me. 
My father died of cirrhosis of the liver and cancer of the lungs. I saw him maybe five or six times in my life after I was, he left us when I was a little boy. Five boys and a wife, mama, never saw him again. And never heard him call my name. A father. I have his name. I look like him. He's a great man, lieutenant commander in the Navy, 35 years, retired, professional musician, but married five times, three at the same time. I'm not supposed to be here today. I'm not supposed to be telling you about somebody who can turn your mat into your testimony, but he took my mat and turned it into my testimony. So what's your testimony? What's your mat? Three last questions. I'm done. What was your life like before you met Jesus? How did you meet Jesus? What is your life like now that you've met Jesus? Let us see your mat. Let us hear your testimony. Being raised in the church no more makes you a Christian and sleeping in the garage makes you a car. Nobody in this room has been saved all your life. There had to come a time when you met Jesus. And there should be some change. Here's what the old people used to say. If you know Jesus, you ought to show some sign. Hey, God. Matt. If you know Jesus, you ought to show some sign. If you're in here and your testimony is a little jacked up, in other words, you can't remember when you met him, you know, how you met him, you don't remember what your life was like before Christ and then how you met Christ and what your life was like now. It doesn't line up, but you wanted to line up tonight. If you're in here, and I know you're sophisticated and saved and sanctified and the Holy Ghost filled and fire baptized and quickened and have a mighty burning fire. But I talked to a lady just Sunday and I said, how long have you been saved? Sweetly saved. She said, all my life. I said, ah, <laughs> wrong answer. How many of you before you came in tonight, you knew what your life was like before Christ? You know how you met him and you know what your life is like now and there's a difference. If that's you, open your mouth and give God a shout in this place. I hate to go over, over. I hate to go over, over. But they're messing with me with that sound. I'm going to get y'all. I hate to go over, over. But let me just say this to you. You need a testimony. And whatever you've been through in life, let that become the testimony that before I met Jesus, here's what I was like. Then I met him, and here's what it's like now after I've met him. Is that fair? How many of y'all have a testimony tonight? If you have a testimony, jump up on your feet and put your hands together and celebrate God. Come on, if you have a testimony... If you're watching online, if you're watching someplace else, if you're watching later, if you pick this up and you're going back and you say, hey, that's not one of those elevate pastors. I don't know who that Papa Smurf looking guy is. <laughs> if you're watching, what I've said tonight is you need a testimony. And whatever you've been through in life, it's building your testimony because our lives are designed such that it's it, it's, it, it is to put us in a position to where things seem hopeless and we realize we need help. And when we do, we come to Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, Jesus heals us and forgives us of our sins and makes us whole. And that salvation produces works in our life and, and causes us to be fruitful. And, 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 and we're created under good works and, and not to be saved, but because we are saved. So what was your life like before Christ? How did you meet him? And what is your life like now? So, Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity to meet with these people. And I thank you, God. And I just pray, God, that just this simple message of a testimony, of having a testimony, of having laid on a mat. All God, I just pray that some kind of way somebody has heard 
that they need a testimony. They need to get their testimony right. That they need to align themselves. That they need to have this testimony that what they've been through didn't destroy them. And it was you that didn't allow it to destroy them so that you can bring them into a relationship with you. So that you can send them home to tell everybody their testimony that the same God that delivered me can deliver you. So God, I thank you for it. So bless those. Bless the other campuses that are watching. God, right now, those who are there, maybe somebody in those places, God, uh, uh, don't have a testimony. Give them one tonight. Let them have one tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All y'all out there, see y'all later. We're going to shout it here just a little bit more. Come on, y'all. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of joy. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of victory. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of praise. Shout unto the Lord, all ye people. Come on, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come on, throw your head back. Reach way down and shout in this place. Before I'm seated, as pastor comes, come on, man. I, this, this guy right here, he's got stock in first watch. <laughs> you still eat there regularly? Semi. Semi. Yes, sir. Every time when I met you, I met you at first watch. Yes, sir. Then when I met you again, I met you at first watch. Yes, sir. Then when I saw you again, I saw you at first watch. I love you, man. I told you that then. I tell you that now. I tell you publicly. And you've got one of the greatest leaders on planet Earth. <laughs> Come on, y'all. The other people gone. We're here now. The anointing on Tim Stair's life that has produced even some of the manifestation has allowed people like yourself to have an opportunity to do ministry like this, to serve a congregation like this, in a community like this. That's awesome. Proud of you, cheer for you, and I pray that all of you will realize that where God plants you, you bloom where you're planted. And what God is doing through Elevate Life and what he's going to do in the years to come is going to take a synergetic effort, a concerted effort of all of you to be able to expand and to grow and to increase. Because you hear the Lord saying, lengthen your cords and strengthen your takes and, and enlarge your tent and get ready for what he's doing. There are many more souls that need to come to know Jesus that need to be saved. You guys are part of the great last day harvest in Jacksonville, Florida and surrounding areas. You guys are it, a part of that move of God. Pastor Gary Wiggins died recently at Evangel Temple. One of my dearest friends in the world. And on his deathbed, he called me with his last breath. He said, Bishop, God spoke to me. And he said, revival's coming to Jacksonville. He said, get ready for it. Tell as many people as you can, as many pastors as you can, that God wants to use them to bring in this last day harvest. But things are about to turn, things are about to change. Come on, God's about to get him some glory. And it's gonna happen when we come together, when we stand together. The world will believe that God sent Jesus when he see us as one and loving on each other. Thank you, thank you so much, Elevate Life.